All right. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Activities for People Living at Home with Dementia. My name is Gail Snyder. I'm the Executive Director for Dementia Friendly Fort Worth, and we are proud to offer this program with funding from the Area Agency on Aging and United Way of Tarrant County. These programs are recorded and are made available through a YouTube channel for future use by families and communities. And today is Cookie Conversations, and I am your host, and we are making peanut butter cookies. All right. Now, can everybody see my workspace okay? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Oh, I forgot to show you the recipe. Go back to my... There we go. So here's our... Whoop. I hate it when it does that to me. There we go. Here is our recipe. And we're gonna start by putting all the dry ingredients together and separating them, which is a, a common occurrence in most cooking, cookie and um, other baking recipes. This recipe is a little bit different than a peanut butter cookie recipe that I have used before because it actually wants you to use peanut butter in combination with real peanuts. Oh, that sounds good. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop the screen share so we can see you guys a little bit better. So we're gonna start out with two and a half cups of unbleached flour. You know, I've always been curious when they talk about unbleached flour because this picture flashes through my mind of Clorox bleach, bleaching flour. And I, <laughs> I don't wanna think about that. So since you have used uh, stone ground flour, do you have any idea what that process is like? For bleaching flour? No. Do you have any idea what they do? No. Hopefully not Clorox. Yeah, no, I don't think so. <laughs> then we need baking soda, baking powder, and salt. and it calls for a half a teaspoon of each. So half a teaspoon of baking powder. Half a teaspoon of baking soda. and a half a teaspoon of salt. And then we're gonna set that aside. And then we need, I already have the oven set on 350. In fact, I have already baked quite a number of cookies, but I did something different to the ones that I uh, put together yesterday Instead of using crushed peanuts, I used crushed cashews to see if there's any difference in the taste. So next we need 16 tablespoons of salted butter. And normally in most recipes, it wants you to use unsalted butter so that you're not adding more salt to the recipe. So I thought that was interesting because it also calls for salted peanut. So I'm gonna go over to the refrigerator and get the butter <coughs> because I forgot to set it out and get it soft. So we're gonna to have to um, use other means to get our butter soft.
And while the butter's softening, we also need a cup of packed dark brown sugar and a cup of granulated sugar. Paulette, since you're from St. Louis, do you recognize this? Oh, White Castle hamburgers. Oh my God, yeah, sure do. Has anybody else ever had those? Mm -mm. No? Yeah, I've heard not, of them. Yeah. Not my favorite. It's not my favorite either, but since my husband grew up there, it's one of his favorite things. And one year for Christmas, his sister gave us a set of dishes. Uh -huh. <laughs> the coffee. No, my favorite was Steak and Shake the large plates and the small plates. And he says when he was a kid and they went, they served the food on real plates like this. Yeah. Wow. And I used to love hoppies. Hoppies? Hoppies hamburgers. You used to hop into hoppies. Oh. <laughs> and then there was also steak and shake. I was not a White Castle fan because they put onions on everything. I didn't like onions. also said that when they went to... Um, the root beer place to get um, a and W root beer. Oh yeah, yeah, they served it in real frosted mugs as well. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They, they did. Yeah, I remember yeah. that. You remember they were, that? They were all frosted over. It's so cold. Yeah, my my husband likes crystals, which is the southern equivalent of White Castle, or at least from what I understand. Which one is that? Crystals. Oh yes. Crystals. My husband says it doesn't taste the same though. But I don't think they have any of those anymore, do they? I think they all closed. I have no idea because I have no desire to go there. <laughs> all right, so our cup of packed brown sugar. Gail, while you're doing that, I looked up the difference between bleached sugar and unbleached, or bleached flour and unbleached flour. Uh -huh. And essentially it says all flour is bleached. Uh, bleached flour, they use chemicals to bleach it faster, age it faster, and unbleached flour is naturally bleached. Hmm. But they're all bleached in one sense or another. Oh, and, uh, bleach it in the sun? Uh, the, the, uh, it's oxygen is what it does oh. and um, so the unbleached basically because it doesn't use chemicals is actually a little bit more expensive normally yes because of the aging process it takes longer to produce um, it's a little bit grainier than regular you know the other flour the bleach flour right so it's even some of the unbleached flowers have used some chemicals. You have to be very careful. You get to watch the brand. Right. So anyway, that was just the difference. I just thought I'd let you know. Well, thank you for looking it up. That's interesting. Um, um, they use uh, chlorine gas and benzoyl peroxide. Oh. As as a couple, there's a couple other chemicals too, but those are two major ones they use to bleach it. And basically just to get it faster. Right. So. Well, um, I think I said this on one of our other uh, cookie programs, but the first five weeks when everything was shut down, it was difficult to find flour. And one of the times I went to go look for it, I had to go to one of the um, Natural grocery markets. Yeah. Get flour, and I think I paid over seven dollars. Yeah, yeah. For a regular package of flour. It's still uh, hard to still hard to find the yeast in the little packets. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I haven't looked for that because I had a jar 
Mm -hmm. The jars in my refrigerator, so I haven't looked for the packets. My, my sister lives out in East Texas in a little town called Quitman, which is north of Tyler and Mineola. Yep. Uh -huh. yep. She bakes a lot. Um, and she said, next time you're in the store, keep looking for the little packets. They come three to a strip and they're perforated. Mm -hmm. right. And so I was in Walmart about three weeks ago and the guy was just pulling them out of the box. The shelf was empty. And I said, let me have about six of those. <laughs> and he looked at me like I was weird. I said, I'm going to ship them off to somebody. And see you go <laughs> well, um, I was at the store last week and I can't remember now what it was, but there was something that the aisle was almost empty. And I thought, that's a really strange one. It was just, and I can't, oh, it was um, the aisle where they keep the crushed tomatoes, the diced tomatoes, the chopped tomatoes, mm. not spaghetti sauce, but the tomatoes so that you can make things. The canned uh, tomatoes, yeah. Uh -huh. Yes, it was wow. almost completely empty and they had put in boxes of rich crackers to help fill up the empty shelf. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> that was really like putting on the Ritz. There you go. So the recipe says now to uh, mix the butters and the sugars at medium speed until light and fluffy. I'm going to turn this up just a little bit so y'all can hear me over the mixer. It doesn't look like I got my butter quite softened enough because my butter's sticking to the mixer instead of the sugar. Our next thing that it wants is one cup of extra crunchy peanut butter. But I didn't have extra crunchy peanut butter. I'm actually using creamy, but the peanuts are going to make up the difference for that. Is that a KitchenAid mixer? It looks like it. It is. My family bought this for me for Christmas probably around 2004 or 2005. Oh, and I used it a lot. So it's about 16 years old probably and I have not had any problems with it. Yeah, we're going to get one for our youngest daughter with the grandkids because they always do a lot of cooking. Uh -huh. They don't have one. Our oldest daughter got one for for a wedding present from wow. somebody. Yeah. Um, we just have an old Sunbeam, you know, which isn't as good as a KitchenAid, but we don't use it that much. It really is nice when you're making bread. Well, they do so much... You know, uh, so many things with kids, you know, right. and so we're going to get her one. She doesn't know it yet, but we're going to get her one. Well, that would ruin all the fun of Christmas if she knew it already. All right, I've got to go to the pantry for some more peanut butter. All right. One after my own heart, you got to have peanut butter. <laughs> wow. That's right. That's right. That protein. That's right. I think I'm going to have peanut butter and syrup and bread for breakfast. I also personally like the peanut butter that they have that has honey in it. Yes, that stuff's good. I think it's better than the other, so so I'm going to use some of that for the rest of this. Yeah, peanut butter and maple syrup is good. Yep. So my husband likes to eat peanut butter butter and jelly sandwiches or peanut butter butter and syrup like white oh, syrup. i always like peanut butter and butter like white syrup All right. i remember working with the boy scouts and they'd have big i don't know how many gallon cans of peanut butter because they get it from the military 
-hmm. You know, it just those those industrial cans of peanut butter. It also get those industrial blocks of of uh, Velveeta cheese and all you know raisins and all of that type of thing. You know, so if you liked it, you could eat your heart's content. It was, it was it. I think I had a whole block of Velveeta cheese one day. I just was about to. That um, cheese like that, um, when I was a kid in Oklahoma, they used to have what they called, they called it commodities. Mm -hmm. And you could, go, I don't know what the process was, but my grandparents were pastors of a church and sometimes they would get that. And it would, would last a long time, but it doesn't have exactly the same texture as Velveeta cheese. No, no. So I'm going to mix that peanut butter into the butter and the sugars. Just till incorporated. And then it wants us to add two eggs, one at a time. My guess is some of the uh, off brands of what we call Velveeta are really more commodity than, than Velveeta. Because they can't follow the exact same recipe. Right. Yeah. Okay, so I've got the two eggs in there. And then it wants us to add the vanilla, and it actually calls for two teaspoons of vanilla. We're going to smell vanilla. Yeah, you smell it? Peanut and vanilla. And vanilla. What's that? Peanuts and vanilla we're smelling. Yes. Yes. Yum. So yesterday after I got the batch mixed up, my husband came, or my son came through the kitchen and he said, what are you making? And I told him, he said, wow, that's a lot of cookie dough. Uh, so it made probably almost five dozen cookies. Uh, wow. Wow. Unlike the butter cookies that probably only made maybe two dozen of mm -hmm. I just had a weird thought. If this Zoom culture keeps going, I wonder if they'll make custom scratch and sniff stuff to send to participants. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. Yeah, we've been talking about that, Janine, when you haven't been here on some other sessions, Patrick has been saying we need some way for some way to sniff what I'm making. Then we'd have to have a way to test to, for everybody to taste it while I'm making it. There you go. That would really be something. Something off of the Jetsons, maybe. <laughs> okay, after we put in the vanilla and mix till combined, then it says to decrease the speed and add the dry ingredients. And then we're gonna mix in the ground peanuts. So one of the recipes in this book actually wanted you to roast your own, but I didn't do that. Um, I purchased a container of peanuts already roasted and salted. And this is going to be noisy when I do this, so I'm going to do both at the same time. It calls for one cup of the roasted peanuts. Mix in the dry ingredients with everything in the mixer. And yesterday when I did this, I accidentally turned the mixer up too high and I slung flour everywhere. You're, you're creating art. What's that? You're creating art. Creating art. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. The art of cookie dough. They never make those bowls big enough to get that bowl in there for you 
pour the stuff in. Well, I have one of those shields that goes over it, yeah. but it just feels like it's in the way. Yeah. yeah. Nobody ever use it. Okay, so now I'm gonna chop the peanuts. So what do we smell? Peanuts. Peanuts. Fresh ground peanuts. It's a wow. very nutty aroma. Can you see this? Yep. Kind of like breadcrumbs or graham cracker mm -hmm. crumbs. Yeah, we've got one like that that does the same thing. It's not as big as yours, but it's a small oh, one that does the same thing. Yeah. I wonder why it didn't turn into peanut butter. <laughs> it yeah, it wasn't. Things to it, I think. It wasn't it ground was long enough. Uh, I like, I get fresh ground peanut butter at Kroger and you pour the peanuts in and turn the machine on and it comes out as peanut butter. Oh, yeah. really? Oh, can't imagine what this would be like if I were using chunky peanut butter. I'm going to bring it over closer to the camera so you can see. Can you see the texture of that? I do, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So it was pretty smooth, but now that I added those crushed peanuts in there, it's got a texture to it, and you can see the little pieces of peanut butter in there, or the little pieces of peanuts in there. All right. So now, the next thing that we're going to do, I'm going to move out, clean up some of my mess. Is to get these ready to go on the cookie sheet. So I have my cookie sheet already prepared with parchment paper and these cookies are rolled. So what is this, the third cookie that we've made that we have to roll into a ball? So we did ginger snaps that have to be rolled and we did the butter yeah. cookie. And we did the, the chocolate ones too, didn't we? Yes. The chocolate ones and these, and they have to be rolled. So that's how the powdered sugar got crinkly, because it was originally in a ball. Yes. Okay, so I like for these to be not huge. This recipe actually says to divide the dough into 36 portions each a generous two tablespoons and roll them into balls about two inches in diameter. That's a big wow. one. That's a big That would one. be big. That's too big. That's too big. So I'm using a smaller scoop. It's probably less than an inch and I'm just going to roll it enough to get it into a ball and put that on a cookie sheet. And my scoop isn't wanting to work very good. It's that sticky peanut butter. Yes. You know, you were talking about having a mixer for people who cook or bake a lot. I have, I bake so little that I think I have a hand mixer with those removable beaters somewhere, but I don't yeah. know where it is. <laughs> it's with mine. <laughs> They're hanging out together. My grandmother had one of those crank beaters. And yes. she made she yeah. made all her cookies and stuff with that. Hey, I have one of those and I know where it is. But it unless was unless I gave it away. It was huge. I've never seen one that big. <clears throat> but she used it all the time. I I wonder if I gave that away because I never used it. But that would be a good thing to have. Well, this, well. this spoon that I went over to the sink to retrieve. 
My grandmother had one almost like this and she always used that spoon when she was baking cookies because it held up to stirring the dense dough. And I ran across that one somewhere and it's one of my favorite kitchen tools. Because every time I use it, it makes me think about my grandmother and baking cookies and cakes with her. That's cool. So as I put these out on the sheet, you can also see the chunks of peanuts in the balls of dough as well. When my kids were little, I didn't want them to be raised on anything unnatural. So I always got stone ground wheat flour uh, from a stone ground wheat flour maker in Deaf Smith County in Texas. And so I used to make all, all, all the bread was homemade. And it was with this unbleached, beautiful stone ground wheat flour. And the little kid who lived across the street thought this was really good. And he used to call it good for you bread. And he used to run over to the house every once in a while, knock on the door and say, Mrs. Cooper, do you have any of that good for you bread? <laughs> so, I want some of that good for you bread. <laughs> And then they grow up. <laughs> so most of you are probably familiar with oh, hush. Um, whenever you get these on here, it wants you to use a fork. This says dipped in cold water to make the crosshatch design that's on a peanut butter cookie but my grandmother always used sugar. So I'm gonna use sugar. It's a family tradition, you don't wanna break it. And the fork sticks to the cookie when you do it even with the sugar too. Are y'all able to see what I'm doing? Yes, yes ma'am. Ma okay. I think that's what my grandmother and mother did too. Always had the sugar. I had to smell some peanut butter, so I went and opened my peanut butter jar. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's maybe one way we could solve the um, issue of you smelling what it smells like when I'm baking is to tell you to bring your jar of peanut butter and your jar, your bottle of vanilla. <laughs> there you go. To the, to the computer so you can smell it while we're baking the cookies. All right, now with these last three, I'm going to show you something else that I did um, to get to get the impression on them. Right back. These are the cookies I baked this morning. One with the cross hatch, and can you see this one? Yes, ma'am. This has little indentions in it. Yeah. So what do you think I used to do that? A marble. The meat, the meat pounder. Very good, Janine. <laughs> so I'm going to do these last three. It's actually a whole lot easier because I have a round meat pounder that just has little um, pointed bubbles on it. And so I dip that in the sugar. And it's a whole lot easier. And I'll hold this up to the camera so you can see when I get finished. Oh, cool. Oh, that is so neat. You've almost made me want to bake some cookies. <laughs> now, can you see the difference? Oh, yes. Cool. Mm -hmm. Oh, fine. I love them. They're so cute. An interesting look. So I'm going to pop these into the oven at 350 and it says they need to bake for 10 minutes.
here's what I've baked already this morning. This sheet. All right. I'm gonna go sit out under my mailbox and wait. The cross hatch and the ones I did with the meat pounder. Those are big already. I can't imagine how big those other cookies would be. These are about, let's see. These are two and a half inches. So, you know, sometimes you go to those places where they have the big cookies that are like this, mm -hmm. but that's what those are going to be like. And then this is another set of the cookies, but if you see the ones on your right, I didn't hear my timer from the other room and they got a little too crispy. Good for crumbles. Yeah. Good for crumbles, but I don't, I don't like my cookies quite that done. How about you uh, all? They'll make good ice cream topping. Yes, I was about to say, vanilla yeah. ice cream. Uh. Good. I like. I, I like my cookies underdone if they're going to be one or the other. I want them soft. Right, right. Me as well. I'm, ha I'm happy either way. <laughs> well, some people like their cookies really crispy. And some people, like Janine and myself, I like them where they're just almost just barely done. And just a light brown mm -hmm. on the bottom. So Janine, these would be good. You would like these because some people would say this is underdone. Yep. And the funny story about underdone and overdone. Um, my husband likes his biscuits and his bread just barely done. And the story behind that is one of his grandmothers, whenever she cooked, she always burned the biscuits to the point where you had to cut the bottom off because it was charcoal and eat the rest of the biscuit. And her cooking <laughs> philosophy was done or raw due to chaw. <laughs> and his dad always made him eat whatever was on the table and he did not like eating the burnt biscuits. So now when I make biscuits, I have to cook them just barely past the point of the raw dough. Oh. Take them out of the oven. And my mom was exactly the opposite. She wants everything done. And when she cooked a hamburger, my husband called it a charcoal briquette. <laughs> and she thought we were eating raw, she always thought we were eating raw biscuits. So I would have to put hers in the oven and leave them a little longer because she didn't think they were done yet. What, so, was, what was that saying your mother in law had? Done or raw due to chaw. <laughs> and his dad was a stickler for you're going to eat it whether you like it or not. Or not, right. But obviously his grandmother did not enjoy cooking in any <laughs> sense of the word. It was one of those things that she did because it was a necessity of life. <laughs> And my mother didn't really like to cook either. Oh, my mother hated it with a passion. She but thought cook was a four letter word. <laughs> she, my mother, because there were six of us, she made lots of casseroles to make the meat stretch and to make things go farther. And my husband does not like casseroles. <laughs> The closest thing he eats to a casserole is when we were first married, he used to like hamburger helper. Oh, yeah. And that's that, nothing like a good casserole. No, but that's no. the thing he likes to a casserole. I do have one that my mother made. She called it um, hamburger casserole, and it was made with egg noodles, mm -hmm. and hamburger with onion, yeah. and Velveeta cheese or that processed cheese. They will eat that occasionally, but not very often. Casseroles are one of those things. It's, it's kind of a, um, depending on part of the country, accept it. You know, right. up in the north, casseroles are just a staple. Right. You know, you go to a church potluck, you're going to have a lot of casseroles, as well as jello salads. 
Mm -hmm. Okay. I love jello salads. Okay. But that's, and that's kind of gone out of fashion a lot of places. Mm -hmm. But casseroles are a staple for churches, you know, but Mm -hmm. you, you think about it, you put it into this casserole dish, you can take it to the church, and it's still gonna be warm by the time service is done. Plus you can you can cook it ahead. That's right. Prepare it, put it in the oven on your before you go to church. Yeah. Take it out of the oven as you're going. It's more Amen. difficult to fry a chicken or make a chicken parmesan and carry it somewhere. And but, casseroles feed a lot of probably the Closest today, the other one I'm going to think about is lasagna. Yeah. It's kind of like the modern day casserole is lasagna. Yeah. 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 But my husband does not like church potlucks because he thinks everything is a leftover. Oh. <laughs> hey, I tell you. Casseroles and he doesn't like casseroles, so he moans and groans if there's a church potluck. <laughs> As a pastor, I learned you had to sample everything. Because somebody would say, did you taste my... That's right. And you don't want to insult any of those old little ladies. Right. <laughs> Tried everything. I well, use let's... my slow cooker instead of baking casseroles. Yeah. I just fix everything in one pot in a crock pot. Well, and that takes us back to Patrick's Dutch oven group. Have you thought about something you want to do in the Dutch oven for us? Not yet. (laughs) (laughs) He's thinking. I reminded you so you could be thinking about it. That's right. Okay. He he wants the temperature to cool off a little bit out more outside. Yeah. Before he does the Dutch oven. Exactly. Yeah. (laughs) Maybe we can do that in November. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Of course, you don't. You don't even have to put the fire out right now. You just put everything in the Dutch oven and set it's, it out in the sun. Set it out in the sun. Go for it. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Save on your utility bill, especially yeah. if you sit it on the the dash of your car. Yep. Yesterday, I got in the car to run an errand, and my thermostat in my car said it was 115 degrees. Wow. Yeah. Because it was sitting facing the sun. I'm gonna go take a peek at the cookies and see how they're doing. All right. I remember those truckers that used to have uh, ovens in their engine compartment. Oh, oh. They baked things in their oven and because they had a little oven in their engine compartment. They used the heat of this, the engine to heat the oven. So there's going down the road, they're baking their supper, their lunch or whatever. Oh, wow. Yeah. And they, they, you know, get there and pull it out. And, what know. was it, in an RV? No, just the truckers. Oh, you know, cooking something from the truck. Yeah, using the the using the heat from the engine to uh, to uh, heat their little oven that they had underneath the hood. Hmm. No, and they well, I don't know what they baked, but there, but they there was a lot of them that did that. Yeah, because it was easier to you know it's cheaper for them to do that than to stop the truck stop. Right. all the time yeah my trucks truck stops get greasy after a while yeah you know, just too many of them greasy my dad's a cross-country driver for a contractor for ups uh-huh he drives from here to virginia okay like three or four times a week depending on the week yeah. and when everything first started shutting down we worried how he was going to get his meals when the restaurants all shut down because there's no other way for them to get yeah. food on the road. And they like leave at 10 o'clock at night tonight. And he has a, a partner driver and they drive all night and all day. And then they get back the following morning. So it's the third day. So if he right. leaves on Thursday, then he gets back on Saturday morning. Of course, now they have the little cooker units that actually plug into the battery. Yeah. You know, and the inside, either a heater or a cooler, those heater or cooler units. Right. So they can prepare the food as they go along. Yeah. Well, talking about toaster ovens and other ways to cook things, when I was in college, I baked a cake in a toaster oven. <laughs> really? <laughs> I want to know where you got that red toaster oven behind you. 
Uh, the to it's actually just a regular toaster. Oh, okay. Um, I like red appliances. My kitchen is red and black, so. I used, I used to have a KitchenAid toaster and it went out, but we ordered this one on Amazon and you can see the toast through the window, but it's just a regular. Oh, how cool. Mm, cool. Two pieces of toast. Well, I use I'm my toaster oven. Turn it up or not? Oh, that is so cool. I'm trying to think, see what brand it is. The Dash. I use Dash. D-A-S-H. When, when my wife was in college, she used a regular old popcorn popper to make up pineapple upside down cake. Yeah. Yeah. Those ones that look more like a, a little skillet with the dome yeah. lid. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. You know, uh, you know, and it's amazing because I have a niece that just went to went to school, okay, as a freshman. And they wouldn't even think of those type of things, you know. They want the uh, the lux of everything. Yeah. You know, uh, you know, hot plates and popcorn poppers and things like that are just, you know, so far from their imagination. Well, and now popcorn is in the individual things yeah. where you pop it in the microwave, so you don't need all those other. Right. Remember when they had the air poppers? Yeah. And the jiffy pop that you popped on the stove in the little pie pan? Yeah. I like that. Yeah. Well, but, but there is something about the, um, I like popcorn and I do a lot on the, you know, in the microwave, but there's just something about the flavor of a popped in a popcorn popper. Oh, yeah. yeah, you can't beat it. Well, I, I have a pan with a glass lid that I use and we like kettle corn. <laughs> and the best way to get that is to do it on the stove. And so I've been buying the jars of the popcorn instead of the microwave popcorn mm -hmm. and add the oil and the sugar to the pan and pop the popcorn on the stove. The problem is I usually eat the whole batch by myself. <laughs> <laughs> I All understand. Right, move the camera around and let's check on these cookies. <laughs> My wife may at one time made the mistake of buying the mini bags of popcorn or a microwave for me. Uh huh. And I did two bags at a time, so you know they last didn't last hardly anything. So <laughs> I just just buy the big bags. He was trying to cut down your portions without telling you, huh? Yeah, that doesn't work. I'm sorry. Popcorn it doesn't work. Is... It doesn't work for John either. When I buy the individual rice puddings and stuff like that. He just eats two of them. My husband has a message for everybody. Okay. What's that? It says, things go better with kale. Uh -huh. <laughs> cookies. Except, yeah, could you feel better cookies, maybe not. But, hey. I don't think so. I don't think so either. <laughs> All right. That looks good. Nice. Looks good, nice, yes. Golden brown and pretty uniform in size. Yeah, they look good. Look good. All right, so when you get your box, you will have some with peanut butter or with ground peanuts, and you will have some with ground cashews. Good and job. I, I like that. I, I see love cashew butter. I was going to buy cashew butter to make the ones with cashews, uh -huh. but they wanted like $12. Yeah. <laughs> For a little pint container of the cashew butter, so that's why you go to Kroger's bulk section and put the cashews in the mixer and make it yourself. <laughs> and when we lived in Thailand, where they grew a lot of the cashews, Sue would make their own cashew butter. Yeah. You know, well, yeah. I could have done that. Um, we buy the cashews at Sam's, mm -hmm. like this, because my husband takes them for lunch. And so I had the cashews on hand, and that was why I thought, I'm going to try that just to see what kind of difference it makes in the flavor. Yeah. I love cashews. Peanuts are a little bit stronger. Yes. Than a cashew. It has, the cashew has a milder flavor. So I want to see if anybody can tell the difference. Sure. Cool. All right. Sounds good.
All right, well, let's see what's up for tomorrow. Cookies, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> tomorrow is Jonathan Sanson, jazz piano and vocals at 1030. And if I'm not mistaken, Jonathan was actually on observing last week. But he yeah. never did. So, because he came to see what it was like, so he would know what to do when it was his turn. So, cool. Good. I look forward to it. All right. Well, y'all have a great rest of the day. And thank Paul, you. Don't go oh, see your mailbox. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Love it. <laughs> Uh, bye. 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 Bye.